The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already been put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then, your Lord and teacher, I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace in your name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We begin with prayer. Lord God, give us ears to hear that we, your servants this day, may we hear of your love for us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, for the littler ones amongst us, uh, during the children's lesson time, immediately after, you'll have some of these wonderful arch books where it has Jesus washing the disciples' feet. So the story we heard read from the lectern just a moment ago, they'll be able to take and with mom and dad open up at home and read it together. I'm now actually going to preach on it. Now, the gospel reading, doesn't that water look good and clear and crisp? Oh, that looks good. But we know what he's about to do with it. He's going to wash feet with that water. And you've all no, no doubt heard this before. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Peter objects to it at first, but then relents. Peter does it a lot, rejects what Jesus says, and gets turned around. But to begin with, I, I point out again how clean and crisp that water is. It looks refreshing. It looks pure, clean. But what if I were to ask you, lovingly as your pastor, just to pick one of your shoes and to slip it off, right? And then you'd have a bare foot there. And for all the guys, I know you have the, like, the dress socks, which are kind of nylon-y. Hmm? And the ladies, well, I don't, I don't even pretend um, to know. Uh, but then what if I asked you to reach down and pull off the sock and let your bare piglets out? Bare foot, hurry, furry little knuckles and all of your toes out and exposed in front of your friends and family in church. Now, at the poolside, no big deal. We don't think of it. We don't see it. But here, if you were to expose your little toes, your little piglets... You might be worried. I've been wearing these uncomfortable dress shoes for a while now this morning. What if the shoe dust stinketh a bit? What if I'm a little less fresh? What if you wore, I don't know, wild socks? And then all of a sudden now everyone would know. Jesus is asking them to expose their feet to him. Now, we're in a different time and a different culture, but one thing that hasn't changed, feet are feet. Feet. They're never the most attractive thing. In fact, they're very functional in nature. Now, we'll try to pretty them up. We'll polish them. We'll give them little rings and things. But they are feet. But at the time of our Lord, when he does this, it's important for us to remember. 
Even when we walk down the sidewalk barefoot, we take the dog out, we go barefoot out there, it's smooth, it's flat, it's clean, it's concrete. Time of our Lord, roads were dusty and rocky places. Animals were the main transport of heavier loads, and they leave goodies behind, which are also in the street amongst the very dust, so your feet get a lot of stuff caked on them. So when you were to sit at table, cleaning your feet is not only ceremonially a thing to do for all of our Hebrew friends, but also it's very practical and pragmatic. They didn't eat in tall Roman chairs. They at, ate at table much lower to the ground. You need to kind of push Da Vinci's Last Supper painting out of your head and imagine them sitting on cushions on the ground where your feet would be much closer to your face. A little less pleasant if they're dirty. And Jesus, in this episode of his salvation story for them and for us, he's reclining at table. He's about to have what we now call the Last Supper. He's about to celebrate the Passover with them. So it's not just any meal, but a very important meal for the people who had worshipped God for all those years, remembering God's deliverance, and all the more with what Jesus is about to do with this meal, something new, something more full for them and for us. But as they're at table, there's a lot of dirty feet. So Jesus, their Lord, their teacher, gets up, takes off his outer garment, fills a basin, fills it with water, and he goes around to wash the disciples' feet. And the way the text is written, we don't know if he started with Peter or if Peter had a couple disciples in front of him to see. Regardless, though, we do know when our Lord does come before Peter and his Lord and his God kneels before him to wash his feet, Peter responds like we would expect. No, 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 what is going on? You, you, our teacher, would never wash our feet. Why is he having to do it? No one else did. No one else did. There they're at table and there's feet to be washed. Who should do it? The lowest. Maybe the youngest disciple or the one who was brought on last. Or certainly when they arranged the room for the meal, they would have arranged for someone to have that service, to be there, to help wash their feet so they could be very important celebrating together. What does our Lord do? He serves. I like how John records it. He loves them. He loves them to the end. There's no bound. There's no limit on our Lord's love. So when he sees feet to needs to be washed, he gets down and he does something about it. Oh, if we had more people that followed that example. Look at that. Someone should do something about it. What about this? Pastor, we really should take care of that. We? It's easy for everyone to notice, but to stand up and do, that's what our Lord, well, that's what he does. He sees the need and he gets down to wash them. And this is an example, and it even says as much, and it is an example of how to love like Christ. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and that is right, for I am. But if I, your teacher and Lord, get down to serve you, you ought to serve one another. No servant is greater than their master. And if our Lord is willing to serve, we ought to as well. And it's a symbol and a sign of his humility, of his lowering himself to humbly serve. And that service, that's what kind of king he would be. A servant king. Like Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, of a suffering servant who would go for his own. They would need him to come to them. And here he does. Simply at table a table we still fellowship around together. That as we gather, we gather not at an altar, but at a table to remember this act of loving service where he poured himself out for us. This foreshadows it. They didn't get it then. You don't understand now, Jesus says, but you will. Our Lord loves us until the end. Here's a hint. That's not at death. It's far beyond. But we have this picture of Jesus kneeling down and washing his disciples' feet. Peter, though, if we look Peter's perspective, we have looking at Jesus, and it's good to see him as a suffering servant. 
see him in his lowered state where he humbles himself to serve. But we also have Peter. And why would he respond so other than, well, he's Peter. But he's one of amongst many who would jostle. Now, John doesn't record this, but Luke does. Before this celebration of a feast, before this gathering, on the road, that dusty road, some things that click, stick to us aren't just the dust to our feet. If that was the only thing to make us tame unclean, that would be good. But some things that make us tame unclean are far worse and stick far tighter than that which cling, clings to our feet, that which clings to our soul. See, God may have humbled himself for us, and this is good news, but the problem is we needed him to do that because so often we elevate ourselves. On the road, walking, some were arguing amongst the disciples. Those who were already following Jesus, walking with our Lord, were arguing about who's the greatest. Certainly I'm the greatest, I'm the smartest. Certainly I'm the greatest because I'm the boldest. Certainly I'm the bravest because I'm in the inner three. Certainly I am because... I am a, and they all had reasons, of course, right? Even a couple of them had mom there on their side. Jesus, when my, you come in your kingdom, can my boy sit on the right and left? Oh, to have mom there cheering you on, not really knowing what she's asking, but saying, could they be there with you when you come into your glory? But our Lord's glory is shown, or as the text would also say, made manifest for us. When our Lord was lifted up and crucified and died, God's glory is that sinners would be forgiven by his death and resurrection. That seat of glory, well, it's not what it, they thought it was. But so often they needed attitude adjustments, heart adjustments, if you prefer, as do we. I don't imagine any of us who came in here to worship today came in not knowing Jesus, not discipling after him, not walking with him in our days, but yet we all come in here needing to be washed clean again. For we come not with dirt. We're in a very clean culture. We shampoo and conditioner and soap and rinse so many different times in so many different ways. It is astounding. But we still come in dirty. We come in dirty with something far worse than anything that would grab to our shoes or to our feet. It's that sin from within us that says, but I, but I, to a God who already loves us and says, you are mine. How many times does Peter say no to Jesus before he just gives up and says, amen. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Amen. How much? But how much do we? Jesus comes to die and rise for us. And as good, faithful Lutheran Christians, we know we are saved by God's grace and His grace alone. And yet, to acknowledge our sin, our need for God's grace, that yes, I'm saved by grace, and I also still, like St. John writes in 1 John, he who says he has no sin deceives only himself, and the truth is not in us. If we want to abide in that truth, it's opening up to say, Lord, wash me again. Make me clean again. It's putting down our own hubris, our own ego, and saying, Lord, amen to what you say to me. If Jesus says to you, let me wash your feet, the response is, amen, thank you. If Lord says to you, I forgive you, the response is, Lord, thank you. Not, ah. Eh, I've got it this time. We don't, never will. But that's why our Lord comes to be that suffering servant for us, to do what we were unable to do. So we can look at it from the point of Christ where we see the eternal and divine God humbling himself for us to serve us. We can see it from Peter and the disciples' point of view when they were arguing who's the greatest, and Jesus says, no servant is greater than their master. If I serve you, you ought to serve others. But what about us? What do we see when we encounter this text with Jesus washing his disciples' feet? I mean, we do this in remembrance of me. We hear regularly the preaching of God's word, the reading of God's word. We sing, we pray, praise, and give thanks in his name each week, multiple services, and even on Monday to make sure we have plenty of opportunity as people together in Christ to abide in his word and his word in us. So how do we encounter our text? To be fair, 
some of us encounter Jesus much like he displays himself, eternal and transcendent, yet personal and right there with us, encouraging us in his word and that we abide in that word and that truth in us and we abide in life, knowing that the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus gives us eternal purpose and identity. It lets us know who we are and whose we are, and it gives us the boldness to encounter each day knowing in Christ we are more than conquerors. And some of us come like Peter, not like this guy. He's got jeans on. He's clearly an American here. He's got blue jeans, and he's in church. And here he is getting his feet washed. How else could we respond but allowing our Lord to love us and to wash us and to free us and declare us again free? But we don't need to hang our heads unless we have something to leave down. If you come to church today and you have anxiety, fears, doubts, ego, any of these things that separate you from your Lord and his love, leave them here. Let them be washed again. Here, as Pastor Ben proclaimed to you again, and I say to you now, in Jesus you are forgiven and free. Hear it again. There's not a condition there. There's not a comma, but, or a comma, end. In Jesus you are forgiven and free. Full stop. To that, we say, amen. Thank you, Lord. We don't need to argue with them that we should have known better. We probably should have. We don't need to say, I'm not worthy of your grace. I'm going to sin again. We, we probably will. But we simply say to God's mercy, thank you, Lord. And as his church today, seek to follow the example he lays. Not that we're going to get a big basin out in the narthex, and after each service, we're going to get together and wash each other's feet. We'd be missing the point too easily. That would be easy. It would be weird at first, but in a world like today, being weird sometimes makes you cool for a while. But that would be easy. What Jesus is asking us to do is much harder. It's to love others as he loves us. That's much harder than the golden rule. The golden rule, which we surmise and shorten down to, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Well, that can be easy. I don't trespass against you. You don't trespass against me. I don't blow my grass on your lawn. You don't blow your grass on my lawn. Really important stuff. We can be neighborly, not knowing or really caring about the other, just trying not to go too far. That's not how our Lord loves Lord, our Lord loves enough to get down his hands and knees and wash their feet to care for them. And all the more, because they didn't know then what this would show, how he would love them, how he would make them clean, how he would make us clean and a people together by serving us, by being lifted up, dying and washing us in his blood, declaring us clean, not just on the outside, but in the inside, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God continues to go to sinners, lead them through repentance to be forgiven. That's why that reading, that psalm from David was selected. Maybe that's where we are today. Lord, give us clean hearts so that, in order that, we may follow this example still. As you are Lord and Master, it is right for us to call Jesus both Lord and Master, comes to serve and to save us. We say amen to that grace. We say amen to God's power shown to us, made manifest by his death and resurrection for us. And we love others as he loved us. I love how our gospel concludes there for today. The text, Jesus says, amen, amen. Verily, verily, or as we render, truly, truly. Truly, truly, our Lord says to us, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Not just an act of service, but it being messengers. Not of our message, but of our Lord's message. That he comes to search out and to save the lost. He is a friend of sinners who need not hide in terror. Our Lord comes to wash them, to clean them, and to declare them part with him in his people. 
And if our Lord loves and serves us, we ought to love and serve our neighbors. This, again, is too hard for us by ourselves. So let us take a moment to pray that our Lord would not only show us this example, teach us this example, but work it within us with new spirits, we pray. Lord God, create in us clean hearts. Wash us again of that sin that sticks to us and that rebellion that walks away or seeks our own end. Help us to put down the search for our own glory and rather glory in your name. Find peace and security in you, our Lord, for you are our teacher of truth, our Lord of the universe. And yet you come to search us out, to save us and declare us your own. Help us to hear and receive this message with grace and say, Amen, thank you, Lord. And help us go to herald this message, to speak this message, to others to hear for a first time and a lifetime that they are yours in Christ Jesus. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we pray.